I'm going to start with number 15. That is the indefinite integral of x plus 3 times dx. Um, so we want to find a function that has a derivative of x plus 3. Um, how do you get a derivative of just 3? That one seems to be more straightforward. If I want to wind up with the derivative of just 3, then that would start as 3x. Take the derivative of 3x and you get 3. Um, remember, with these ones, we, let's always look at the power. This is a power of 1. Uh, so we know that we would need to start with a power of 2, so that when we subtract 1 from 2, we wind up with a power of 1. So we'll start with x squared. Um, but if we take the derivative of x squared, we get 2x. We just want 1x. So when we bring down this 2 down in front, we want it to be multiplied by something that uh, results in a 1. So how about a 1 half? 2 times 1 half will give us x to the, will give us 1 in front. 1 half x squared will give us x to the first as its derivative, plus c, of course. Okay. Um, 22. We want to find the indefinite integral of the square root of x plus 1 over 2 times the square root of x. Uh, and we have this dx. dx just tells us that the derivative was taken, that the derivative was taken and gotten this with respect to x. Um, so as we go to find the function that has this as a derivative, Oh, this is going to be a little tricky. It's helpful if we rewrite this integral as uh, one that has powers. So we'll do the 1 half, okay, plus, and we'll do 1 half times, uh, this would be x to the 1 half, but it's in the denominator. We want it to be up in the numerator, so it's x to the negative 1 half. Okay, and this is all times dx. Now it becomes a little more clear, not crystal clear yet, but a little more clear. We have powers. We like exponents. We like to just uh, know that we took the derivative, subtracted 1 from the exponent, and got this. So if that happened, if we subtracted 1 from the exponent, that exponent for that one would be 3 halves. You subtract 1 from 3 halves, you get 1 half. That should say halves. You subtract 1 from 3 halves, you get 1 half. But we want to wind up with a 1 here. If it was 3 halves out in front here, that'd be great, because that's what the derivative of this is, 3 halves times x to the 1 half. But that's not the way it is. We want to take 3 halves, bring it down in front, and get multiplied by something that causes it to be 1. So how about 2 thirds? If we multiply 3 halves by 2 thirds, we get the 1. When we subtract 1 from 3 halves, we get 1 half. Um, OK, plus. Um, and we're starting to see now, or have already seen clearly, that uh, since this is the derivative of some function, we're find, trying to find the antiderivative, then the same way that we split these up, um, that we split up functions when they're ad added uh, to take the derivative, it works the same way with antiderivatives. If we're going backwards, then I can just take the antiderivative of this, plus the antiderivative of this, plus the antiderivative of the next one, and so on. Uh, so antiderivative of this first, plus the antiderivative of this. Um, we want to wind up getting a negative one-half power when we subtract from whatever this power is. Okay, so what would we subtract uh, from, uh, subtract one from and wind up with negative one-half? But that would just be positive one-half. Right, one-half minus one is negative one-half. Um, and that's uh, kind of our luck, is if we multiply one-half out in front, that's exactly what we have here. That's what we wanted to wind up with. So one-half x to the negative one-half, that is the derivative of this function. So we found the antiderivative. If you really want to double check, uh, we've already kind of done it as we've gone along, but we just take the derivative of the whole thing. Right, 3 halves times 2 thirds is 1. That's good. Subtract 1 from the power. 3 halves minus 1 is 1 half. That's good. Um, 1 half times x. OK, 1 half times x to the subtract 1 from this power. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. So we did do it correctly, just to double check. Next, we will do number 25. 
we went to indefinite integral, uh, 1 over x to the third dx. Of course, we, we talked about this in the previous uh, video. It's helpful to write this as x to a power. If we put x to a power, then we get to add 1 to that power and work from there. So we'll make this negative 3, x to the negative 3 dx. Uh, so the function that has this as the derivative would be, OK, we'll start from the beginning. Uh, we know that this would have to be a negative 2, because when we subtract 1, that'll give us negative 3. We want to wind up with, negative, with a positive 1 here. So we're going to make negative 2 times a negative, so that that's positive. Multiply it by 1 half, so that we get positive 1 and plus c. Next, 29. Uh, let's see. Oh, I wanted to do 28 first. I knew I had skipped one somewhere. Uh, so x squared plus 2x minus 3 over x to the fourth times dx. Remember, all this is telling us is that the derivative was taken with respect to x. Um, so this looks like quite a doozy. Um, so far, look what we've, we've had. We've had functions uh, added to other functions. Nothing too crazy. Now we have the, we have one function, this function, over another. Um, stay away from trying to do like a quotient rule or a product rule. We're not taking the derivative. We're going backwards. Um, it would be kind of tricky to find the two functions that were divided that would create this antiderivative, or th that created this derivative. Right? You see what I'm saying? It would be very difficult to, um, given that we know what the, the, the quotient rule looks like, to try and find the two functions that produced this uh, as its derivative. So instead, let's rewrite this as x to a power plus x to a power plus x to a power plus x to a power um, by doing it this way x squared over x to the fourth plus 2x over x to the fourth minus 3 over x to the fourth we can do this because um, it's like breaking this apart into three fractions that have the same denominator right so Every one of these can get its own denominator of x to the fourth. Um, now, this guy here, if we divide uh, um, the variables of the same base, you know, x and x, then we just subtract their exponents. So 2 minus 4 would give us a negative 2. Right? If we canceled these two with two of these, we'd have 1 over x squared. We, re we would rewrite that as x to the negative 2. So we're fine here. 2 times x over x to the fourth, we could cancel this x with one of these x's, get 2 over x to the third, we would wind up writing that as 2 times x to the negative 3, uh, minus 3 times x to the negative 4. Okay, and all that's times dx. This is something we can work with. If I'm going to wind up with a negative 2 exponent, I would have gotten that by subtracting 1 from the power of the function that it's the derivative of. So we'll do x to the negative 1, right? Subtract 1 from that. When we take the derivative, we will get negative 2. But we still need to wind up with a 1, a positive 1 here. So if we put a negative there, then negative 1 times negative is the positive 1 we need. Subtract 1 from the power, you get a negative 2. OK, on to the next one. We, If we're going to wind up with a negative 3 in the derivative, we would have started with a negative 2 in the uh, in the power when we subtract one from negative two we get negative three um, we want to wind up with a positive two as it is right now if we took the derivative of x to the negative two we would get negative two x to the negative three we want positive two x to the negative three so we will make this plus a negative x to the negative two okay on to the next one uh, let's start with the power. Don't worry about this guy yet. Let's start with the power and say, what would we subtract 1 from uh, in order to wind up with x to the negative 4? We would have started with x to the negative 3. Okay. Um, 
and what we want to wind up with here is a negative 3x to the negative 4. Okay, so what if we just you know, put a plus there? Because what's going to happen is the derivative of x to the negative 3 is negative 3x to the negative 4. You bring down the negative 3, negative 3 times x to the subtract 1 from the power, negative 4. Right? So I could put a negative out in there, out in front, but just made that positive. Right? The derivative of this is exactly what we want. Um, so we just make, you know, we kind of just mess around with things until they are the way we want them. Um, if this was added x to the negative 3, it would give me, uh, in the end, minus 3x to the negative 4. This is what I want. Uh, so we'll put plus c. We'll clean this up just a little bit. Um, maybe we'll put things back in the denominator, right? Like negative 1 over x uh, minus 1 over x squared plus 1 over x cubed. So that's interesting. That's kind of a, a simple looking function. Negative 1 over x minus 1 over x squared plus 1 over x to the third. Um, so, yeah, to find the function that, that created this by the quotient rule, that would have been pretty uh, pretty tough to do. So we just break it up into x's to powers and it becomes much easier to find the antiderivative. All right, let's go on to 29 now. Uh, dx. Okay, same kind of reasoning here as we used here. When have you ever taken the derivative and wound up with one function times another? Remember that this is the result of having taken the derivative. Not that we're trying to take the derivative of this function. That would be simple enough. We would use the product rule. It would be no big deal. But there is no product rule that we know of uh, for uh, integrals for antiderivatives. So how can we take this and write it more like this, where we have x to a power, x to a power, x to a power. Um, well, if we just multiply these together, that's exactly what we'll have. So we'll have 3x squared, and we have negative 2x and positive 3x, so that's a positive x, and 1 times negative 2 is negative 2, and dx. So now we look for the function that has this derivative. Okay, we'll work with the power first and then fix it if needed. So what, um, what power of x would we need so that when we subtract 1 we get 2? That would be 3. Okay, let's see if the derivative of this is that. 3x squared, yes. That's exactly what we needed. So no, nothing needed. We don't need to fix it in any way. Okay, the derivative or the antiderivative of x. Well, to wind up with x to the first, we'd have to start off with an x squared. Okay, the derivative of this would be 2x. We don't want 2x, we want 1x. So when we bring down the 2, we're going to multiply it by a half so that we wind up with 1x to the first. Minus, okay, what has a derivative of 2? Two? Well, 2x. 2x has a derivative of 2. Negative 2x has a derivative of negative 2. And we have our plus c. Okay? Pretty, pretty cut and dry. Now we'll go on to 35, bring in some trig functions. Integral of 2 sine x plus 3 cosine x dx. Okay? I can almost guarantee you right now you're going to get fooled. Um, what's the antiderivative of the sine of x? You might be tempted to say cosine of x. But remember that the derivative of the cosine of x is what? The negative sine of x. So if I just write 2 times the cosine of x, well, the derivative of this would be 2 times the derivative of the cosine. The derivative of the cosine is negative sine, but this is positive. So we do negative. Negative 2 times the cosine of x, because when we take the derivative of cosine, we get negative sine. So negative sine times negative 2 would be positive 2 sine x. 
Okay. And with the same reasoning, uh, the derivative of sine of x is cosine x. So the no, there is no negative needed here, just 3 times sine of x. Because the derivative of, the, of 3 times sine of x would three t be, be 3 times cosine of x. Okay, just a, a fairly simple example to help you see we're going the other way. We're taking the antiderivative of the functions that they give to us. Okay, uh, 42 is the antiderivative of the cosine of x over 1 minus cosine squared of x dx. All right, well, um, let's see. Mm, the only way that we can wind up with a quotient when we take the derivative is if we started with the quotient rule. Um, think of it, there's, there's no other time when you take the derivative that you wind up with a function in the numerator and a function in the denominator. Um, no other way than to start out with the quotient, but to try and figure that out, to go the other way and figure out what those two functions are, one function over the other that creates cosine over 1 minus cosine squared, that's quite a task. Um, so let's think of how we can rewrite this. We can't do cosine over 1 minus cosine over cosine squared, right? We can't break it up that way. That's not legal. Um, so what else can we do? Well, there's, this, there's these Pythagorean identities. Um, let me just write it, one of them, the important one here. This one we should be not too unfamiliar with. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So sine squared, if we subtract cosine squared from both sides, is 1 minus cosine squared x. Okay. To be honest, I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't know the answer, but this certainly seems like a good way to go. We'll take the indefinite integral of a cosine of x over uh, sine squared x dx. Um, now the, let's see, if we kind of split this sign up a little bit. Um, this is the same as the cosine of x over the sine times 1 over the sine. Okay, I'm, I'm working off the fact that somewhere in my book at least there is this list of the derivatives of trig functions. So I'm hoping that what I wind up with is going to be the derivative of some trig function. Okay. So what I have now is the antiderivative, or the indefinite integral, of cosine over sine, which is cotangent. And uh, this here, the 1 over sine, is called the cosecant. And then we have the dx. So something like this looks like it might be the derivative of some function. So if we go back to 136, um, we see that's just one place. There's probably a several. Um, that show you the derivatives of some trig functions and some derivative rules and stuff like that. But if you look, uh, you'll see that the derivative of the cosecant of x, that's just on that page, it tells you that the derivative of the cosecant of x is equal to negative, how do they write it, cosecant x cotangent x. So the derivative of the cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. I have cosecant cotangent right here. So if I make my function the negative cosecant of x plus c, then the derivative of negative cosecant of x is going to be, let's just show that this is true, negative, negative, Co, let's say cotangent, cosecant, cosecant x. Uh, so yes, when I take negative of the negative, I will get positive cotangent cosecant. Okay, so here, that was what I was looking for, the antiderivative of cosine uh, of x over 1 minus cosine squared x is 
negative cosecant x. Okay, that was a fun one. I'm sure you will agree. Um, now let's go on to the last one. This is going to be number 50. I'm going to try and paste a graph in here. Let's see if this works. It worked. I'm just going to have to move it. Maybe over here. around here uh, all right 50 they give us that some function has a derivative this means derivative right so the derivative of some function is x squared minus 1 okay um, and they're saying so there's this thing right here right it says negative 1 3 and you can see that that, that point is on uh, the graph here, is plotted. Um, what they're saying is if we, if we said there's some function that has this derivative, right? dy over dx equals x squared minus 1. First of all, let's understand what this thing is. This is called a slope field. Okay. Remember the derivative is all about the slope. Okay. And this function is the derivative of some function. Okay, so it describes the slope. Um, but remember how there's all these different functions that have the same derivative. They, they're all right, plus c. It's some function plus c. Okay, so a lot of different functions could have this as the derivative. Um, if, if this is the derivative, this describes the slope. So the slope is defined by take the x value, square it, and subtract 1. So we're at the x value, and see how that's completely um, without regard to what the y value is. It doesn't matter what the y value is. Okay. Um, so anywhere along here, take the x value, which is 1, square it, you get 1. Right? Then subtract 1, you get 0. So the slope is 0 wherever x is 1. Whether the function be up here or down here, it doesn't matter, it still has the same slope. It's going to have a slope of 0 through here, even if it's up here, way down here. All of those functions have a slope of 0. Okay. Um, so let's, let's take the antiderivative of this function, see a little bit more what we're talking about. Well, if we subtracted 1 from some exponent and got 2, that would have to be a 3, and then we, that would have to be 1 third x to the third, so that we get 1 times x squared. Uh, minus, okay, what has a derivative of negative 1? Negative x has a derivative of negative 1. Plus c, right, plus, if I put plus 5 and I took the derivative, I still get x squared minus 1. Graphically, if I had a function that was, say, right through here, like this, this function would have a slope of 0 at negative 1. It have, we would have a slope of about negative 1, exactly negative 1, and x equals 0. And then I have a slope of 0 here. You see how if my graph passes through, say, this point, then it would have a slope of 0, then it would work into having a slope of approaching negative 1, then negative 1, then a little bit bigger than negative 1, then 0, and, and it would just follow these slopes. Right? Depending on where, what point is actually on the graph, it would just flow through these slopes in this slope field. So what they're saying is the graph passes through negative 1, 3, so we know that it's way up here. So this graph is going to go like through there and have a slope of 0, then have a slope of negative 1, and then have the slope and a slope of 0 again, slope of 1 maybe again, and then just going up like that. Okay, not the best looking thing. Uh, then it would go through here, it would have this kind of a slope right there. A slope like that and then plummeting downward okay so this looks like maybe this function is one-third x cubed minus x plus 2 maybe it's plus 2 okay I don't know if they want us to find that function or just sketch it uh, they want us to sketch 2 Sketch two approximate solutions of the differential equation on the slope field, one of which passes through the indicated point, which we've done. Uh, use integration to find the particular solution of the differential equation, and use a graphing utility to graph the solution. So, um, 
particular solution is it means this well there's lots of solutions to this differential equation it's just a function that has this derivative and this function has this derivative uh, you know if this was zero or if this was two or this was negative uh, negative one right negative one would move it down one like this uh, sort of approximately so this would go like this and this would have a slope of zero here and then it would go down and have slopes like that it would come over here and it would have slope of zero and then go way up like that. See how they look identical, but this one's up here, this one's down here. Okay, so we're saying that any function that has this derivative will look like this, right? Uh, this will be where we plug in x, this will be where y comes out, and what is that c? Which c is it? It looks like, you know, maybe it's plus 2, maybe, you know, it doesn't exactly work out that way. Um, what we do know is that that function goes through negative 1, 3. So that we know when we plug in negative 1 uh, plus whatever that c is, we get negative, or we get positive 3. So now we can just solve for c, and we'll find out what that particular c is. Uh, so we have 3 is equal to, this is going to be negative 1, so this is going to be negative 1 third plus 1 plus c, this is going to be 3 is equal to 1 minus 1 third, that's 2 thirds plus c, so c is going to be equal to 7 thirds. Okay, so we just subtracted 2 thirds from both sides, this is 9 thirds, 9 thirds minus 2 thirds is 7 thirds. So the particular solution that passes through negative 1, 3 is 1 third x cubed minus x plus 7 thirds. That's the particular solution. Now don't be too worried that it's not uh, plus 2, right? I, I didn't draw it perfectly correctly. It doesn't exactly work like that. I can't just plus 2 and say that it's going to intersect at 2. Um, though, actually, that, it does work in this case. Uh, so 7 thirds is just a little bit more than 2, so maybe to be more accurate, my graph should pass right through there on that on the y-axis so there you go it's a, a differential equation uh, slope field uh, particular solutions um, and we'll be seeing more of slope fields uh, and that's that's all it is if I want to draw a graph that fits this slope field that has this derivative then I just start somewhere and follow the slopes and it'll look like that and uh, you know I just showed you the whole other process to say it again would be pretty repetitive. So thanks for watching. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.